Hi. Hi, Sandy. Amazing, beautiful country. I mean, for a, a tiny little country, um, it has everything. It has culture, it has art, it has gastronomic, it has history. It has the, some of the most beautiful national parks, an amazing seashore. It's just, it, it's just a jewel. It really is a jewel in Europe. So I'm very excited to um, share Croatia with you. I know some of you have been and excited to kind of have a little revisit and others, you know, I know it's on your list to go. So um, I'm going to introduce Maya and I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna butcher her last name. Maya is Croatian and she has a very Croatian name, which my Croatian is, doesn't even exist. It's not even bad, it doesn't even exist. But Maya is, um, for those of you that were with us for Italy, um, when we had Olive Tree Escapes, Maya is Beth's partner. And Maya is, so Olive Tree Escapes does Italy and Croatia. So um, Maya is the Croatian part of Olive Tree Escapes and Beth is the Italian part of it. So not that, of course they, they cross over, but um, Maya is wonderful. I have done many itineraries to Croatia with Maya and my clients come back just <laughs> raving and she just, whatever you need, whatever you want, whatever you desire, Maya makes it happen. And it's wonderful and seamless and beautiful. And she's a delight to work with. So I'm so happy to introduce Maya and to share Croatia with you. So Maya, take us to Croatia. Uh, good evening, everyone. Thank you for having me tonight. I always get excited when I get a chance to present Croatia. And I hope that um, Tonight, I'll be able to share with you my homeland uh, that I happen to be in right now. And oh, two I didn't realize so you are. Wow. <laughs> oh, my goodness. <laughs> if, I, if I say something wrong, don't hold it against me, please. So what is it? Two o'clock in the morning or something? Two o'clock in the morning, yes. All right. Yay, no, <laughs> awake at this hour before COVID, but right now, you know, there's nothing to do. So you go to bed early, you wake up early, and you just, you know. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I am going to start sharing my screen so you can see the presentation. Oh, Warren came. Hi, Warren. Yay, we're glad you're here. <laughs> and Carol yeah. and Michaela. Hold on, let me make it bigger. And oh, there you go. I hope everyone can see this. So I'll start by saying that Croatia as Sandy mentioned, is a very small country, but it's very diverse. And just to give you some perspective, um, it is the size of West Virginia. So not a big state. I mean, in the US, we don't consider West Virginia to be, be the big one out there. Uh, this is me. And yes, my name is very Croatian, even though Maya is international. My last name, Gudel, is very typical of this inland part of Croatia. So if you ever come to Croatia and you say my last name, most of the people will be able to pinpoint exactly where my grandparents came from. <laughs> um, and I am the Croatia specialist at Olive Tree Escapes. So I like to start by showing a map. Um, so one of the reasons Croatia with its small size is so diverse is because of its shape. And these little stars you see on the map, um, these are some of our most popular or let's say most um, interesting locations. And that's not to say all the other places aren't amazing. Uh, this is just, you know, a combination of those that you might have heard of already and those that you will hear about, well, at least in the next half an hour for sure. Um, and then if you look on the map towards, well, on the map, it would be up to the left. You'll see that we are right on the border with Italy. Um, it takes about, I would say, you know, from this northern part of Croatia, about an hour to cross into Italy when everything's normal. Um, there's a little bit of border, you know, controls and whatnot, because Croatia is a part of European Union, but not a part of Schengen. And I'm saying this, um, it's exciting, because as a non-Schengen member of the United, uh, of the European Union, we are allowed to have Americans, even in these times. So 
the entire summer we had people coming for a little bit longer periods. A lot of them chose to work from Croatia, um, you know, so two, three weeks. Um, we had clients that rented a villa, then went on a boat for a week, then came back to a hotel. So they ended up staying for a month and a half this summer. Not everyone was, you know, that lucky, but we also had clients that, you know, could not miss their Italy fix um, in 2020. So one of the stipulations was Americans can go into Italy as long as they spend two weeks in Croatia first. Uh, so, you know, it's a little bit of a hoopla in these times, but we managed to pull off a lot of nice trips, even in these difficult times. So um, I will start with our capital, uh, which a lot of people think you should skip the capital. You know, it's not as interesting as the beautiful turquoise waters of the Adriatic. Uh, but for anyone who's a lover of history, culture, and food, and wine, Zagreb is a great spot. It's also a great spot to fly in or fly out of. Great connections to the U.S., um, we have uh, what I think would be our best sparkling wine uh, just on the hills a little bit outside of Zagreb. So that's one of the things you can do uh, as a day trip out of there. But the think of Zagreb, I would say it is something like Vienna, just a lot smaller. So this city was built mostly during the Austro-Hungarian monarchy. Uh, the history is mostly tied to that, and the architecture resembles it very much. Um, so it is a nice intro into Central Europe, let's say. So Croatia is like a mini Europe because we were conquered so many times by so many European nations, and everyone left a trace. So in Zagreb, you see a little bit of the Central European spirit. Um, it is vibrant throughout the year. It is our biggest city with one million people, which still is not a big one. And the most common uh, comment we get from clients is that they didn't expect it to be so much fun. Um, and, you know, in fun, we mean, you know, great restaurants, scene, excellent museums. Uh, there is a museum of broken hearts in Zagreb, which actually yes. ended up being, <laughs> it ended up being a worldwide franchise. I believe one now exists in Los Angeles. Yeah. So, uh, this couple, they used to be a couple back in the day, they came up with the concept of when people break up, whether it's a relationship or a marriage or even a friendship, they, you know, have all these things that remind them of that relationship. And they've asked people to send these items to the museum so they can put it on the exhibit with a little story about what they're breaking up with. So one person actually sent a box of uh, pizza dough because she was breaking up with carbs. <laughs> um, and for Zagreb, what is really um, special is that every year they put on a Christmas market and this image you see right now, this is um, the ice skating park. So they turned the entire city into a Christmas market. It's been named the best in Europe three years in a row um, and people, it, it's, you know, you see Europeans coming here every year it's full when you go to Zagreb in the winter around this time you'll hear every uh, language Europe has to offer uh, and in general it's a fun time to be around Zagreb there are all these little um, uh, let's say mobile houses that you know you have the mulled wine all the uh, special food uh, people like to hang around just you know meet their friends go ice skating um, and just walking around it's really magical and then in january we have a um world cup world skiing cup race uh, on january 6th if anyone ever wants to come to zagreb for that it is one of the things that you can go and enjoy i love zagreb and and i thought that um that, that you know the market there is really it's what i remember the market in prague was in early late 19, in the 1990s and, and 2000, you know, where you actually had the actual um, people who did the handicrafts and all that. I mean, the, the market in Zagreb was really beautiful. I mean, in Prague, it's now full of Chinese souvenirs. I mean, it's just not what it was, you know, decades ago, but you get that in Zagreb, it's beautiful. And, you know, Tesla was from Zagreb and, you know, fabulous food. I, I loved it. I think it's a great city. 
Well, it's, you know, like with every big city, it's kind of a melting pot of Croatia. So you'll, you, you can go to Zagreb and um, taste all the food you want from all over the country. Um, and actually the Zagreb food tour is one of our most popular tours out there. Um, usually people either like when they land to have something that gives them something to do so they don't get, go to bed early, um, but they don't want it to be full on history on day one, or they're so tired from everything that they just want something for the end. So the Zagreb food tour is spot on, uh, either as a welcome or a goodbye. Yeah. Um, and, you know, it's um, in the Dolats market that you were referring to, my favorite souvenir to buy are these little um, handmade umbrellas. So they're not umbrellas for the rain, they're those sun umbrellas, mm -hmm. um, but they uh, hand out the, uh, whatever is on them, the hearts usually, that's the symbol of Zagreb. Um, but to move on from Zagreb, because we have a lot of ground to yes, cover. Yes, yes, yes. Um, we are now going to Istria, which actually I believe the wines you're going to be tasting, um, they're the most similar to what you would find in this region. The unofficial capital, let's call it that way, of the region is Rovi. And by unofficial, I mean, this is the place where most of the clients like to stay in, just because this, this image you see, this is the entire town. So there's about 7,000 people living in it. It is not big, but it has um, actually one of our first Michelin star restaurants was in Rovin itself. And it's a great um, location to visit the rest of the peninsula that is known for many great things. And the big three are olive oil, wine, and truffles. Uh, it is also a great entry point. Um, I know a lot of people like the non-stops if they can get them. So if you are coming from a town where you have a non-stop into Venice, it's only three hours from Venice. So once you land, you get into a car and we get you to Rovin in three hours. Um, it also has a ferry connection to Venice. So maybe you are on a cruise ship and you want to do a little extension or you're just coming from Venice into Croatia. You know, you've been to Italy first, now you wanna go check out a little bit of Croatia. Rovin is a great spot to start exploring. It does remind me a little bit of Venice just because of the house is going almost directly into the water. And then when you walk around the old town, um, you have all these little cute bars and restaurants and they all set up their tables all around these um, rocks that you can find around this tiny little peninsula. So sunsets, they say, in Rovin are fabulous. Um, and usually we like to, if possible, of course, um, if you're having dinner reservations, there's this one great spot where you can dine and you literally see the sun going into the sea. It is pretty magical. But the most important or the most fun part of Istria to me, here on the left, this was, me and my friends this summer because we were exploring Croatia because we couldn't go anywhere else. Um, and we, this was in the middle of an olive oil tasting. So Istria is known as Terra Magica in, um, or at least that's how the Romans used to call it. And one of the reasons they called it that is because they believe this was one of the best areas to produce olive oil in. And this is not just me making this up. The uh, magazine called Flossole, which is, um, I guess, the wine spectator of the olive oil world, they've pronounced Istria as the best region for the production of olive oil also three years in a row, possibly four. I don't know what happened this year. I have to say 2020 has been a blur in many ways, but the olive oil is excellent. Um, there are many small producers. So Croatia in the nothing has a big, big producer. So we don't have a big producer when it comes to wine which is one of the reasons you could not um, find the wines for your tasting tonight. And we don't have big producers when it comes to olive oil. Uh, we do have a variety of different kinds of olives and we have some great producers. I mean, one of my favorites is there are two cousins one cousin has started this in the nineties. You know, they have a big on production. I mean, big 
a more serious production. They have a tasting room, everything's a little bit more professional. Um, and they will take you through all uh, of the more formal parts of the tasting, you know, how to taste, how to buy your oil, how to know what's good. And then the cousin takes over, but the cousin produces organic olive oil. He's the biggest producer of organic olive oil in Croatia, but he takes you on a walk through the olive grove. So he actually explains, you know, why each olive oil is different, why you should approach olive oil tasting and pairing with food just like you would wine, because not all of, not all olive oil has the same characteristics. So if you have um, oil that's a little bit, you know, of a stronger taste, a little bit overpowering, you don't want to put it on fish because it's going to overpower the fish. You want to put that on meat. So anyhow. You need to come to Croatia for him to explain this to you too. But this concept, honestly, was the first time I heard it from this guy. And I thought, wow, it's brilliant. It makes sense. But it never occurred to me. You know, olive oil was olive oil. You put it on whatever you want. And um, the wines, which you will taste similar ones. I won't talk about them much. But then the truffles. So we have the white truffle, which is September through December. And then we have the summer black truffle. And this is something you can, you know, you can go into the woods with the dogs. Um, I have to say most of the people say they want to go truffle hunting, but then when they see the woods, which is almost always very muddy, they just stop to do the tasting part, uh, you know, the food and all the deliciousness. And in Istria, which is actually something I had Beth try on her last trip, I think she had her first Italy uh, Zoom with all of you when she was in Croatia with me, right, right. and I took her to have uh, truffle ice cream. Which oh, is sign me up! <laughs> mm -hmm. It is it, it's addicting. So thank God I don't live in Istria, because I'd be there every day. Um, then we we move on to Plitvice Lakes. Um, this place is possibly the most famous uh, national park. In Cro I mean, it is the most famous national park in Croatia. It is also under the UNESCO protection, which is why you're not allowed to swim in it. I know a lot of people, they when they see the water, they just have this need to touch it and possibly go in if it's a hot summer day. Uh, but you are not allowed to do that, but you are allowed to hike as much as you want and walk around. The park itself is quite huge. Uh, you can spend, I mean, for people that really love and enjoy hiking, they could spend two to three days hiking six to eight hours per day to see everything, to, you know, to see the entire park. Um, for those of you that just want to see the highlights, a two to three hour hike is enough. So that's where you see the most, impart, uh, the most impressive part of the lower lakes that come with a lot of waterfalls. And that's what makes everyone go wow um this is somewhat between so you can either visit it from zagreb as a day trip or we usually do it on the way to the southern part of croatia so towards the coast um this i think sandy you were telling me about yeah. how you thought the, day, the day i was there unfortunately it was really pouring rain but it was still amazingly beautiful and the waterfalls were just so full from the rain so we didn't get to stay as long and even there's a boat ride on a lake and you know everything's open and so we were just getting soaked in some of the nice outdoor picnic areas and stuff like that but it, it was so amazingly gorgeous in the pouring rain that you know on a beautiful day it's just got to be unbelievably spectacular and it's even spectacular now because it's covered in snow or in frost Wow. Um, the guide was telling me that she loves it when it's frosty, but then it's most beautiful because it's peaceful and it's just white. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, the waterfalls might not be as impressive. They're the most impressive in spring just because all the snow melts and all the water comes down. But it, there's just serenity and, you know, it's nature. It's beautiful at any time right. you want. Every to season it. has its special things. Correct. I believe this is fall and you just see fall foliage yes. here, which is like we all rediscovered nature in 2020, I think, too. So Maya, can you pronounce the name of the lakes again? Someone was asking. I know it's very hard. <laughs> so Plitvice. 
Fleet Fleet Sake. Correct. Fleet okay. Sake Lakes. Um, but you know, see, it's a series of waterfalls that creates um, the system of lakes, 16 lakes connected by waterfalls. That is the main part of the park. And then there's the whole forest part, which nobody besides the serious avid hikers actually go and explore. Okay, so we come down to Split, which is on the coast. And that's actually where I'm at right now. This is my birthplace as well. Um, I spent quite a lot of time in New York and people always used to ask me, you know, do you miss home? Of course you always miss home. And I always used to say, I'm either going to live in New York City or I'm going to live in Split. And then they were, they looked at me like I was crazy because these two places could not look more different from one another. Uh, but I always said if I needed, you know, more peaceful lifestyle, living by the sea, why would I go somewhere else when I have it all at home? So. Split itself is um, a town that, that was uh, started in fourth century by the emperor Diocletian. And we have Diocletian's palace in the center of town. That's actually what the town grew out of. Um, so we are, uh, the, if you see this bell, to bell tower in the photo, that's actually the heart of the palace. That bell tower was erected where uh, right next to the mausoleum that Emperor Diocletian built for himself. However, as he was the biggest prosecutor of Christians there were, and people of Dalmatia at that time were already converting to Christianity. As soon as he died, they took his remains from the mausoleum, threw it away and turned his mausoleum into a cathedral, which we claim is one of the oldest ones in continuous use in the world. So when you go into our cathedral, it's quite small. So, you know, don't think of St. Peter's Basilica, huge um, building in Rome, but very, I mean, it's the size of a mausoleum. But what makes it so interesting is that they added all these Christian um, uh, paintings and um, sculptures and whatnot, but there are still remains of the paganism because it was, you know, Diocletian did not, he was, the son of God and you know there were all these um I, I don't want to say statues but the um relics that show him as the son of the God so it's a little uh controversial uh, but it's fun it's something fun to explore so from split you have great uh split is also the biggest port um but passenger port not cargo or anything like that passenger port in all of dalmatia with great connections to the islands so this is where you can go to any of the islands in the vicinity including some that we're going to go over in the next few slides um, it also has, so Split by itself is a UNESCO World Heritage Site because of the palace. So the palace shows continuous life from the fourth century. It started off as a palace, it was his retirement palace, but then the town of Salona, which used to be the capital of the Roman province of Dalmatia, got, um, you know, once Roman Empire was gone, then all the barbarians started coming down and the people of Salona thought that the best place to hide would be the fortified palace of the Diocletian. And they started building their own little houses within this palace. So today you have 16 palaces within the palace itself. And they all range from Gothic to Renaissance times. Um, I mean, it's just a very lively, lively place. Uh, we have a great fish market. We have a great green market. Um, so we, you know, we can do a cooking class where you can go shop for your own ingredients and then you make um, whatever you decide to make, you know, we send you a list of um, items you can choose from beforehand. Um, and it is also one of the filming sites for Game of Thrones. Not as big as Dubrovnik, which we're gonna go over later, but it is still a notable one. And this is actually the center of the palace. So if you look straight through, that's where the emperor had his own private quarters. To the left is the cathedral and the bell tower I mentioned. And this square is special because in the summer they put on opera perform performances here. And what you see straight in front, it, it's a natural stage. I mean, they put some you know, decorations on it, but they don't need much because you have this antique fourth century live stage basically. 
Um, so it is something, you know, if you're here in July, it is not something to see. This is nighttime palm trees. It is the Mediterranean after all. And I put these two fun slides on the left. This is the, this, it looks a little bit like Pompeii. It's all ruins now, but this is that uh, capital of the Roman province of Dalmatia called Salona, which got destroyed by the barbarians. And this was actually on the left. Uh, we did a tour uh, this fall when Beth was here. Uh, this is one of our favorite guides and one of our favorite general managers of a hotel I'm in right now, actually. Um, they were, uh, the guide was uh, baptizing him because this is where they were getting baptized, this little cross um, back in the day. So Salona is also a UNESCO World Heritage Site because it is one of the most important uh, examples of uh, early Christianity in Europe. And then to the right, just to show that Istra, even though they have the best olive oil, is not the only olive oil region. We have olives all over Croatia. And this to the right is actually on the island of Sholta, which is a small island half an hour from Split. Um, and uh, you can, you know, you can ride ATVs, you can go for a picnic. We actually had a picnic in the olive grove. Um, you can, you know, just enjoy, even if you just want to go and enjoy the beaches, that's something to do. But the reason we love Sholta is that it's undiscovered. So we in Split say that we don't want to tell tourists about it because something has to be left for us. And we are off to Vis. So Vis is one of the islands that you can access from Split. So whether you want to go by a ferry boat or if you want to go on your own private speedboat for the day, um, this beach that you see when you're accessing from the water, you can't see it because these two rocks, I know it doesn't look that way from this image, but when you're out on the sea, it seems like your skipper is going to take you directly into the rocks. But then you have this most amazing place. It was voted, I think, one of the best beaches in Europe or, or something like that. Um, many times over. Um, Mamma Mia was filmed here part two and the funny story is that it's this island is actually representing Greece. Uh, the Greeks I guess after part one they were asking too much money from the production or everything was going to cost so much that the production just decided to film on Vis and pretend it's Greece which really did not make the Greeks happy. They got pretty upset <laughs> because we got all the uh, press coverage um, and uh, you know if, if you watch Mamma Mia 2 it, it has amazing footage of the island itself. The special thing about this island besides the beaches and this is actually the town of Vis which was founded by the Greeks um, is that this used to be a military base during Yugoslavia. So this island was completely closed off until Yugoslavia fell apart. Completely, you know, the locals could come and go, but U.S. visitors couldn't really go. So there is actually a military tour of the island that you could do. Uh, it has all these secret tunnels, and um, it's it's pretty uh, interesting. And um, it's known for all these grottos. So we have the blue grotto, just like you have in Capri. I mean, not just like, but so, let's say similar. You know, the blue light, and you go into the cave. Um, this is the green grot grotto in the photo. Here, people go cliff jumping off of these rocks. That's not for me. I don't like to risk my life, even though they tell me it's not risky. Um, and then these two photos actually to the right, I wanted to show you just the color and the clarity of the water in Croatia. Um, these are my personal photos. Um, my dad is a captain and we have a little boat. So in the summer when I'm lucky that mom and dad take me along, I get to see this all the time. And I'll then vouch that the water is that <laughs> color and is that clear. It, I mean, you, and we don't have any of, um, uh, you know, Medusa, sharks, none of that. So you can dive off wherever you want, basically. And to the left, we actually have my favorite lobster pasta. We have lots of lobster and most of it comes from this island. Um, and places like this where you can eat right by the sea are there are many. Um, this is just one of those places close to the Blue Grotto that makes my favorite pasta. And now we're off to Hvar. Again, we are an hour away from Split on a hydrofoil. 
about the same on a private speed, speedboat if you wish to take um, a day boat trip or if you want to stay in town. So the image you see is the town of Faritel, which has some yachts in this photo, but in the summer it's full of mega yachts. Uh, it is our version of Saint-Tropez. Uh, that's where all the rich and famous want to go. But besides this, Hvar is also, there's so much more than just the Hvar town itself. So Hvar town is a cute little town to explore. It is also historical. It has one of the oldest theaters in Europe. Yes. But Stadigrad Plain is a UNESCO World Heritage Site because it is, um, it shows how the Greeks used to divide plots of land and farm. So besides that, I mean, there are other, a little bit newer uh, archeological findings than the Greeks, uh, BC, but we also have amazing wines here. And I will tell you a little story about the wines that you may or may not know, but, um, I'm not sure if you're familiar with uh, Gurgic Hills. That's one of the wineries in Napa Valley. Mike Gurgic originally is from Croatia, more specifically Dalmatia. He emigrated to the United States many, many years ago. And he started working for Robert Mondavi. And when he was working, I believe for him, uh, the blind tasting of Paris that, um, where the Chardonnay won from Napa and, and then I think Stag's Leap Bordeaux. Um, everyone was overjoyed because finally the French were starting to see that, you know, Napa is a good wine growing region. He was the winemaker behind the Chardonnay. So that's how he got his fame. So once he got his fame, he started telling people that the Zinfandel really reminds him of this grape back home. And everyone thought he was completely crazy because, you know, Zinfandel comes from Italy. Everyone knows that. However, he managed to convince a professor at UC Davis that she should test the grapes and figure out where Zinfandel comes from. So I, I believe they tested around 300 grapes and they did come to a conclusion that Zinfandel's closest relative and the original Zin comes from Croatia. And we don't have the original Zin anymore here, um, but we have Plava Tmali, which is predominant in the Southern Dalmatia. It's a great red wine um, and it is the child of the original Zinfandel. So um, this is something that you can start tasting in Hvar. Again, the water, which is just, so in Hvar you can do a little bit more of um, it doesn't have to be just sun and beach and sea. You can do hiking, you can do biking, you can do wine tasting, kayaking, um, you know, uh, off-roading. Uh, there are, you know, options to keep active. And then you can just lie on the beach, which is my favorite activity. Uh, and this is just one of the views from Hvar itself. And the reason I mentioned that it's like Saint-Tropez is because we have a lot of beach clubs here. And that's what's in the photo on the left. That's one of the beach clubs, but they have amazing food as well. Uh, Bonavox of U2, he, was, um, he came to this place year after year because he just loves the head chef there and he wants him to make him lunch every time he's around. And then to the right, um, just some photos of a wine cellar um, of one of my favorite wineries, which is Plenkovic Winery out in Hlar. They make excellent Plavats Mali. And then we're off to Korčula. So now we're, you know, we're kind of making our way down south. Um, Korčula is also known as the birthplace of Marco Polo, which the Venetians will never admit. And, you know, we Croatians like to exaggerate. We like to say that the White House was built from the rock that came from the island of Brač, which is a great story, but most probably not true. Uh, and this is Korčula, where actually Marco Polo could have been born here because Korčula at the time was under Venetian rule. So, you know, he was Venetian, but just geographically, he was born in Korčula. Uh, it is about two hours from Split, and this is a great midway point between Split and Dubrovnik. The Nice part about Korčula that in this photo you see kind of the land uh, across the channel, that is Pelješac. So this Plavac Mali and the Zinfandel and where Mike Grgic was actually from is all from this peninsula. 
This peninsula is also the only one that has two uh, protected wine sorts, not sorts, sorry, positions. So we have two appellations, and those are the only two appellations in all of Croatia, which is Dingac and Postup. And the reason they're special is because um, the some parts of this peninsula are so steep and they're so rocky. So the only thing between, the, so the grapes get the sun, the soil, which is so close to the sea, so the minerality, um, and there is no pollution because there's literally nothing around it. Uh, we have, I think, the, well, actually, I don't know what happened at this inauguration. We know that they planned to serve wine from one of the wineries in Pelješac, but then we never, we didn't, didn't figure out if they actually had the lunch where they were supposed to serve this because of COVID. Um, but that was the intention. Uh, the Ben Musha family winery was supposed to have their dingach um, at the presidential inauguration of 2021, which is pretty big deal for Croatia and this unknown peninsula that most people can't pronounce its name. See, so this is, you know, see, you see uh, Pelješac on the right side, and this is the town of Korčula. Um, a lot of our towns are actually on peninsulas, just like this one, Rovinj was on a peninsula. Um, the crossing between the town of Korčula and the peninsula only takes 20 minutes, and there is a passenger ferry that leaves every hour. So they're, they, they're kind of um, a symbiosis. They, they work together, these two areas. And this is just one of the towers from the Venetian rule. Um, so some people refer to Korčula as Mini Dubrovnik just because of the walled part. Um, and it does resemble it, but I mean, the walls of Dubrovnik are after all a little bit more, they're bigger and therefore more impressive. And just the two photos, the left is my favorite winery with the best view in all of Croatia, I think. So when you're, um, just want to have lunch or a snack. Um, this view, especially in the summer, just to get a break, enjoy, be happy. We're all alive uh, and hopefully COVID's over once you get here. Great spot to enjoy it. To the right is a winery that uh, ages the wines under the sea. So we're still in the peninsula of Pelješac, but what they do, so on this image on the right hand side, you see an amphora and you also see a bottle. So both were placed under the sea. Um, and then, you know, in two years that either is under the sea, you, you see a lot of marine life on it. Um, they bring it out, they crack it open. But one fun thing that you can do is you can actually go diving to see where they put these wines to age. So you can either do a scuba dive or you can just do a snorkel. They have both options. Uh, and we have a lot of clients that actually choose this, especially um, if you have a multi-generational family on a trip together, everyone opts to do a different thing. You know, some will stay, eat, drink a little bit. Uh, some will go and scuba dive. Some will go and snorkel. Um, so it's, it's a fun activity. And they were actually one of the first ones to do this in the world. And finally, we come to the Pearl of the Adriatic, as some call it. This is Dubrovnik. Uh, which is all the way down south. Uh, Dubrovnik is actually the only one that has a nonstop or used to have the nonstop flight to the US in 2019. Um, and that's the Philadelphia on American Airlines. Um, this is also UNESCO World Heritage Site due to the walls. Dubrovnik was uh, the first republic that recognized United States as an independent country once it declared its independence, which if you go to Dubrovnik, every guide will proudly tell you once they hear you're Americans. They are also the most recent claim to fame is of course, Game of Thrones. That's what everyone, um, well, not everyone, but most of the people go for it. Even if you haven't watched Game of Thrones and I haven't, I still do enjoy seeing where, where all these scenes have happened. Uh, it is one place where it's a great end or a start as well. And the reason why that is, is because the town itself is quite small. Uh, you know, it's not gonna be something where you will spend, it's not Rome, 
So it's not something that's going to tire you out. You can actually have a balance of enjoying the seaside because there are many beautiful resorts and many beautiful islands in the vicinity and some exploring. It is also right next to Montenegro. It takes about an hour to, to get into Montenegro to cross over. Uh, so you can have a nice day trip or you can go into Bosnia because the town of Mostar is about an hour and a half away. And the nice thing about this is, um, just as we mentioned in the beginning, how diverse Croatia is, this will show, you know, if you have some interest in history, this will show you how diverse Yugoslavia was and how close we all were. So the border with Bosnia is only 20 minutes away from Dubrovnik. And some of, you know, the architecture is completely different. So think of Istanbul. They're mostly Muslim. So they have all this, you know, Tur well, mostly Turkish architecture because the Turks did conquer this area and they were ruling for a long time. In this whole time, Dubrovnik remained a independent republic until January 31st of 1897, 1897. Um, that is when the French finally conquered it after centuries of independent rule. Um, they say they were the first diplomats because they had such an important position on the Adriatic when this used to be the main trading route between the Middle East and Venice. Um, this is just one of, usually on a summer day, you can see so many yachts moored in front of Dubrovnik. And this is the inner part, so within the walls. And I will end this part by saying that Dubrovnik Republic was um, rich. They were very rich because they had lots of salt. And the salt, uh, salt where they collected it was in the town of Ston, which was the at the border of the Dubrovnik Republic. Today, the town of Ston is famous for the oysters. So we have the so-called uh, European oyster, which in most places in Europe actually no longer exists because in the 70s, the cargo ships have brought something that attacked most of the oysters um, in the Mediterranean and completely made them disappear. So the French, Spanish, they imported the so-called Japanese oyster and that's what caught on and that's what you can taste in most of these places today. However, because this Bay of Stone is so um, indented and well protected, it, this never came. So we still have the so-called European oyster there. And this is such, uh, you know, people that uh, are in oyster farming, when they were emigrating to the United States, a lot of them ended up in New Orleans and the biggest um, producer, I guess, or farmer of oysters in the New Orleans area is of Croatian descent probably because his grandparents or great-grandparents taught him how to do it right in Croatia. And on the left, this is just our guide on a little private island in the bay where you can go and taste the oysters directly from the sea. This was also from this summer. Um, he was just showing us the process here. And then the ones on the right-hand side are the ones that we got to taste, which were delicious. And I'll just end with uh, a little overview on when is the best to go. So whoever wants to go for the beach and beaches in Croatia are amazing. Um, I would say mid-June to mid-September if you want the Adriatic to be warm enough where you can swim. Uh, if you come from the Northern States, you will probably think October is totally fine too. Uh, we have people coming from Norway who come in March and they think it's great. I think they're crazy. If you're uh, looking for anything adventure related, whether, you know, something soft or super um, intense, then you wanna look for months that aren't as hot. So avoid this period when you would go for the beach. Uh, you don't wanna bike around anywhere. You know, if you, if you wanna go biking in July, I would tell you to wake up at 6 a.m. and nobody wants to wake up at 6 a.m. on their vacation. Yeah. Um, I, I'm going to jump in here now because I think people can read this because we're, we're, I mean, this has been fabulous, but I want to make sure we have enough time to do a little bit of wine. There's a couple of questions that kind of popped up. Um, Lynn wants to know, is there some place near 
to stay um, Plevinsia <laughs> Lakes? Yes, yes. There are a few properties. Um, I mean, these are not going to be your uh, five-star luxury hotels by any means, but they're lodges. I would say they're a nice four-star lodge. So for exploring the park, more than enough. And then uh, in terms of gluten, because we were looking at the delicious pastas, um, what about gluten-free and other dietary concerns? Are the restaurants and other places um, able to accommodate people who have food allergies or issues or things like that? Absolutely. The only little problem is when we have uh, out proper allergy, when they need to have separate kitchens, that's something we would need to work on a little bit more strict about. But if it's, you know, where some, you know, these particles, if they end up somehow, they're not gonna cause um, a hospital visit, then yes, everyone can accommodate. Okay, great. You know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna let, let's hold some more questions for Maya till after we do the wine tasting. Cause I don't, I mean, this will, we'll never get through. So Maya, hang in there a little bit longer. You can go to bed and soon. <laughs> So everyone, um, Maya, thank you. This was fabulous. And we'll leave it open for questions um, after we do the, the wine tasting. So now I wanna, um, and you can stop sharing now, Maya. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I'm gonna turn this back over to Warren. I think most of us know Warren, but in case we've got somebody new today, Warren is um, a friend, a colleague. Um, he has turned his passion for wine into a business he's, he's uh, concierge, um, wine uh, purveyor. I mean, he comes up with the most wonderful and delicious and unusual wines. Um, I've called him the Wikipedia of wine and um, he's just amazing. He's charming, he's very knowledgeable, but he's not a wine snob. He makes wine tasting fun, enjoyable for everybody, whether you're a wine connoisseur or this is your first tasting, Warren's gonna make it fun and enjoyable. So Warren, let's taste Croatia. We've been looking at all this great stuff. Well, thank you, Sandy, and welcome everybody. Lots of familiar faces. And after that introduction, I guess I should just say good night. <laughs> <laughs> where, where do you go from there? Thank you, Sandy. So, um, and Maya, that was really terrific. It reminded me, I was actually in, um, in that part of the world, uh, spent a couple of nights in Zagreb in 1996 on my way to Sarajevo um, to do some consulting work for the World Conference on Religion and Peace. Uh, it was supposed to be this ecumenical coming together of the Jewish community, the Muslim community and the Christian community. Suffice it to say, after five days of negotiations, we couldn't even agree on an agenda and we all went home. <laughs> but drank a lot of wine, ate a lot of food and it was pretty interesting. Bullet holes in the walls, no hotels. So I know, it's amazing. Way, that part of the world since 19. But there is that one cor corner in Sarajevo where there's a mosque, a synagogue, I think a Catholic church and a um, uh, Rom yeah, the, the Roman Catholic, you know? So there's the, on four corners, there's the four religions with their houses of worship. So anyway, I just recall it being extremely beautiful. People were wonderful. Food was amazing. Um, the wines, uh, you know, have gotten better and better and better. As Maya said, a lot of the wines we're familiar with here in, in the United States, like Zinfandel, a lot of those, a lot of those varietals originated in there. And yes, the Italians get their noses out of joint a little bit when you tell them that a lot of their wines from Puglia and other places originated there. But that's not surprising. When you look at a map, you look at Italy and you look at Switzerland and Austria, Slovenia and Croatia, no one told the grapes that someone put a line on a map and called it Croatia or Italy or Austria or whatever. The geography is the same. The climate is more or less the same. It's not that far from Dubrovnik or Split over to Venice or um, in those, those other parts of, of, of Italy. And um, so the grape varietals are very similar and we have, a, and, and we're all the way. And unfortunately, I couldn't really find, and we went through this uh, before, I think Lisa, you're on, Lisa Van Buehler's on the call. We did Croatia once before with another group of, 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 of folks. And it was just very difficult to find, especially here in California, East Coast, a little bit easier, 
um, you know, the really good Croatian wines. But trust me, there are some phenomenal ones from Croatia, Slovenia, Hungary. And the white wine we have tonight, um, so I went as far north and as far east in Italy as I possibly could for the wines we have tonight. So these wines are all from Friuli, Venezia, uh, up in the very far northeastern corner of, of Italy about Venice. And the white wine we're having tonight is from my favorite uh, white wine producers in all of Italy. In fact, one of my favorites anywhere. They make gorgeous, gorgeous wines. Uh, and that is uh, Vita Romans. And I, put, I picked for tonight the Friulano, Friulano Doli, because this grape is Tokai Friulano. Tokai being a wine, they called that grape Tokai over in Slovenia, Croatia, Hungary, etc. And, and in Italy, they call it Friulano and Friuli. And it's just a gorgeous, uh, a gorgeous white wine. It's a native varietal, obviously, of that region. And um, I see um, some of you already uh, drinking it and tasting it. And uh, a wonderful winery, uh, from, uh, fifth or sixth generation now. The current owner and winemaker is a lovely woman. And um, more and more women are actually becoming prominent in the wine industry. There's, there's, there's less chauvinism than in the past when the sons usually took over. And I'm pleased to say that the women, the women are um, more pleasant to deal with. I like women. My mother was a woman. My wives have been a woman. My daughter is a woman. I like women. So, um, and uh, it's a lovely winery. And the, the wine, if you taste, I mean, just the nose on this wine, um, just beautiful floral notes. I mean, it's almost, it's jasmine, right? And honeysuckle, it's got honey tones to it. Just, just beautiful, beautiful nose. Mm. And in the mouth, you get those, you know, a little bit of citrus to it, but also very honeyed notes to it, I find. But what I love most about this wine is the balance, that acidity that, and, and, and the minerality that comes from the terroir. Because if you think about it, that's the Dolomites and in, in, in the Alps up there. And it's all old volcanic rock. And as we've discussed on past calls, you know, the, the, the volcanic influence in wine, um, Sicily and other places, and Italy's mostly volcanic rock from top to bottom, is just, the, just gorgeous, gorgeous wines. Wonderful food wines. I'm not sure if any of you, I'm sure Ginger cooked again. But you can imagine seafood, um, just any 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 type of of of, of wine of, of food of that of, of that nature would be would be very would be very very well um, enhanced with uh, with with this wine and both. And that's what happens. I mean, in Croatia, my experience was this. In Italy, it's not just drinking wine. In America, we tend to go and drink wine by itself. But in Europe, particularly in Italy. And, and the region around there, it's very rare that you'll find people drinking wine without food. And they sort of go hand in glove. And I think this is a lovely, lovely, lovely food wine. So does anyone uh, have anything to say about yeah, the- Yeah, feel free to un unmute yourself and, you know, comment or ask Warren or, do you like this? <laughs> I think it's great. So it's, I mean, it's a pretty obscure varietal. You don't find it, uh, you know, everywhere. And I, I was pleased I was introduced it many years ago. And this winery and this particular wine has sort of been a, a, a standard for me. The red wine is really interesting. It's quite obscure. It's from some same region, a very small family owned winery called Luisa. And um, the, I think is from the 1930s, um, perhaps. But it's uh, the, the grape is Refosco, which is um, native native to that area. It really doesn't grow anywhere else. They don't really produce it very much anywhere else in Italy, and they call it Refosco dal Peduncolo Rosso. And the Peduncolo is the Italian word for that little piece of the fruit that attaches the grape the grapes to the vine. And then sort of gives it that color. So if you look at the color on this wine, I mean, it is extraordinary. Dark. A deep garnet red, red color. And the nose, the fruit on this, just beautiful black fruit, blackberries and, you know, just dried plums. And it's just an extraordinary, extraordinary, powerful fruity, fruity nose. 
I mean, deep bold. This is this is a big wine. I mean, so you can imagine this wine would be great with with stews, with steaks, you know, with any of those any of those traditional things, and probably go great with a cockle van, um, which I had last night. Actually, it was lovely. Did anyone make the Dalma Dal Dalmatian stew? That would be good with this. We did. Yeah. We did. It's still cooking though. It needs probably another hour. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, you have to give us a report. Uh, we did. We, we made it here. It's done. It's still awake. Yeah. Oh, Lori, you it. did it. You made it, Lori. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> you liked it, huh, David? Yeah. Very wonderful. Yeah. Wonderful. Wonderful. Yeah. All yeah. right, there's a good recommendation. No, and so we found did a you dessert use... wine, a beautiful dessert wine that had a little bit of uh, cherry in it. Cherry. Is that what you used for the dessert wine in it, Lori? Yeah, and at first I thought it was a little too sweet, but it was. It turned out after you cook it for four hours, it mellowed out. So maybe you could post it the, that wine in the Facebook group. So if people want to do the recipe and that was easily available or something, that might be a good one for people. To I will do that. Put in the sure. chat. Or if you can put it in the chat here, that would be great. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So um, and the you. recipe looked delicious, but we didn't make it yet. Right. Well, 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 it did have steps involved. That's for sure. Right. So I mean, this wine really would be perfect for that. So Matt, you'll send me an email later, but. I, again, this wine's got great fruit. It's also got, it's, it's not very tannic. So I wouldn't say it's a wine that's gonna age for 20 years, but I think it's very approachable now. Pleasant to drink young. A lot of fruit, a lot of flavor, a lot of perfume. And very soft, a velvety mouth feel, which I, which I really like. It's got good legs, the, 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 the back of the mouth and the palate. I think just a, just a lovely, a, a, you know, it's just a lovely Tuesday night wine, even though it's Monday. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, if you don't drink the whole bottle tonight, it'll be there for Tuesday. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I think this is a this is a, it's a, a a wine that's modestly priced, and I think the the white wines are a, a little bit more um, dear in in terms of cost. But we're, you're talking about a twenty five dollar bottle of wine here. The the free the free lino is more of a 40 45 dollar bottle of wine but i think you know for 20, 25 dollars i mean this is an incredible value on a very pleasant wine and you know something that you go to grigich and hills and, and get a, and, and makes great wine but you get a wine of this quality from napa from grigich it's going to cost you 75 dollars and um so i think tremendous values you've heard me say particularly in, in italy and and that and that um that part of the world i say um, anyway, I, I do hope you like the wine. So anyway, I've got an email question now from Hallie, which says, Warren, why do you drink the red wine chilled? Sandy, do you want to take that one? Yeah, that was that was my mistake um, because earlier Warren said that people were, were drinking the red wines too, too warm. And I interpreted that they should be chilled more than they should. Right. I did correct it in the hour before thing, but if you didn't if you didn't check the hour before, I told you to take them out of the fridge. So that was my bad. Yeah, well, that's uh, here's, the, here's the general rule. I'll I'll go back to it. I think this was series two or three. We talked about this. Is quite often you'll go into a restaurant or or a bar and you'll order a glass of Chardonnay so and it's like ice cold. And the problem is if you make if you make white wines too cold, it just suppresses the flavors, the nuances, the bouquet. So you really want to drink drink white wines. That, you know, put them in the refrigerator certainly to chill, and then you know take them out 15 minutes beforehand. So it just takes that bitter cold off it, and I think and and really really enjoy those wines. And you know don't feel shy to you know warm it up in the glass if you find it a little bit too cold, or let it and and let it develop in the glass and see as it warms up. Particularly Chardonnay, high quality Chardonnay from Sonoma, from Burgundy, from Australia, from these other places. The, the nuances and the character of that wine really begins to emanate. Like to time, Even this Friulano, which I uh, I actually had quite cold early on, my first sip, but in the hour that we've been here, the wine has warmed up and actually has become much more interesting and, and, and complex uh, for, for my palate than it was when it came right out of the refrigerator 
an, an hour ago. Now on the red line, you know, if you go to a you go to a restaurant or we're in our homes and especially on the east coast there, you guys have got a blizzard going on, you've probably got the ace, you've probably got the heat cranked up to 87 degrees. Yeah. Uh, you know, and well, you know, most homes, you know, we're running 68, 70 degrees, you know, in terms of room temperature. So we say room temperature. But for me, red wine works really, really well at like 62 something, 64 degrees, something, something like that. So when I say we drink red wine too warm, it's actually it's it's really warm in a yeah. restaurant. So my recommendation is to say, I've been known to see people looking at me very strangely in restaurants when I ask the sommelier to put a bottle of red wine in an ice bucket for two or three minutes, just to bring that, that temperature down because that it, it, it just gives the wine sure. a little bit more pleasant and interesting to drink because if it's too warm, it's here looking at it, it, doesn't, it doesn't tend to satisfy the palate in the same way. You don't get that expression of tahuan and, and, and things like that. So it's the opposite effect in terms of how subdue flavors in red wine for me. So, so Warren, this is Ginger. I did the shrimp, which was very good with the white wine, but I also read pineapple somewhere in the notes. And so I made a pineapple crisp. So Lori, if you haven't warmed your pineapple crisp that we traded earlier today, you should. Um, so I, it goes really well with the white wine as dessert. Yeah. Oh, that would be good. Yeah. And it was really simple. It was really easy to do. Well, Ginger, maybe you can post your uh, pineapple crisp recipe in the Facebook page. I, I will do that. I mean, okay. it's like a can of crushed pineapple and cinnamon and flour and butter and something. Yeah. 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 Right. <laughs> some, of, some of us need the recipe, Ginger. <laughs> So Lori and I, Lori and David and I traded food today, so we did a little. Oh good! Oh good! Oh good! Oh, you guys are amazing! You guys are amazing! Yes, Lori, you have a question, or were you just waving? Hi, hi, Lori. You're on mute, Lori. You're on mute. While she's doing that, Sandy, I have a question. I was just gonna. It's all about us. Zoom meeting from hell. Go ahead, Lori. Oh, 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 quick, quick. I was just waving and saying hi. I wasn't okay. have a comment, but I did post the the. This is the the sweet wine. I posted the name. Okay. No. So, yeah, it's nice. Good. All right. Thank you. Good. I have a question for Maya. Maya, what is the name of the winery where you can scuba dive to see where they've buried the bottles? That's really neat. It's called Edivo. So it's E-D-I-V-O. And what city is that near? Stan? Yes. The other one that's next to is really complicated to remember and pronounce. Uh, <laughs> but the one where you showed the pictures is Edivo. That's, but that's the only one that has, you know, nobody else does this. That's they cool. have one in the island of Pag, which is way up north. So when you put stone and a Devo, that's, that's it. There's nothing Very else. Neat. Well, it's, it's interesting. There are actually some wineries. So there's a champagne producer, Leclerc Briant, who has a wine called Abyss, Abyss, Abyss. And they riddle the bottles, you know, the champagne, and they twist them to riddle to get the the bubbles in the bottle, they actually put the wine in cages at the bottom of the ocean and let the motion of the waves riddle the bottles to put the bubbles in. And then they, they bring it out. And um, it's phenomenal wine, but the USDA and the FDA um, won't allow uh, it to be imported into the United States. You can get mercury infused lobsters from the bottom of the ocean are brought into the country and all kinds of, you know, shrimp that are destroying the, 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 the flora and fauna of Vietnam, but you can't get a bottle of wine from the bottom of the ocean. Um, it's, it's crazy, crazy thing. So write to a congressman if you want to get wines riddled at the bottom of the ocean or aged at the bottom of the ocean into, um, into the United States. Um, but of course, the wines that they salvaged from the bottom of the Titanic, those they could sell. <laughs> so, anyway. 
Any more questions for Maya or Warren or anything? Anybody? Oh, yeah, Warren, this is Cindy. Can you bring that wine back if you buy it over there? Uh, legally? Legal. Well, I won't ask you to answer that question. No, I mean, you, 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 I mean, you, it, it's not available for sale in the United States. I mean, if you were lucky enough to, to get uh, an opportunity to visit the Clec Briant, and they, they don't really do tourists, it's a special invitation thing, they will sell you a bottle and you can put it in your suitcase and go through nothing to declare and hope the dog doesn't smell a barnacle on the, on the bottle on the bottom. <laughs> Or you uh, so buy that though? while you're there. I think it's worth yeah. taking the chance. I mean, if you go there and, you know, buy a bottle and, you know, and, and bring it back. But, you know, that's the beauty of travel. Everything's time and place, right? You'll probably, you drink it there and it'll be amazing and fantastic. And you'll bring it home to San Francisco or Raleigh or wherever you are. And you'll open up and you say, this wine was much better when I was lying at the pool <laughs> than it is sitting in my apartment in Manhattan. Right. Very true. But Good. also remember what Maya said that they have some wonderful olive oils that you can't get here. So, you know, bring those padded little plastic things and bubble wrap and everything in your suitcase and, um, you know, take that stuff home. I mean, what I do is uh, I always take like a duffel bag or something. So I put the breakables or the precious items that I get in the heart and then the dirty underwear and the shoes and stuff go in the duffel bag and, you know, it's protected and go home that way. So, you know, I always love to take back as much of a country as I possibly can to bring it home with me. So I'm, a, I'm always a, a big one. I'm, I am the queen of heavy packing. I don't get this roll aboard can travel for three weeks. Not me. So we, <laughs> another travel tip. We use our cowboy boots or our snow boots to bring bottles of wine back. Oh, great. Great, that's really great, yeah. And always throw extra plastic bags in, you know, zip kind of one. So if you have anything that's liquid or something and bringing back, no matter how much, if you just put it in the, in the plastic bag, if you do have a little whatever, it won't ruin everything. Any more questions for anyone? All right, well, this was fabulous. We went over a little bit. Maya, thank you. It's now after three o'clock in the morning in Croatia. Me. You get to sleep in late and um, enjoy it all. Um, happy Valentine's Day to everybody. I love you all. Um, Monday is President's Day. So on Tuesday, we'll go to Chile. And for those of you that were with us for Argentina, Loli is coming back to do Chile because she does Argentina, Chile, and Uruguay. So she's all excited. I saw her today and we kind of went through the presentation and I'm ready to be on the plane to Chile already. So um, anyway, it's going to be fabulous. It's so great to see you. I've missed you all. And um, I'll see you next week, but it's Tuesday next week, but you'll be getting the emails and everything. And so we'll get together again. All right, everyone, take care, stay healthy, and we'll see you next week.